My name is Chantelle Warner. I'm one of the two co-directors of CIRCLE. We're the Center for Educational Resources and Culture, Language, and Literacy. Uh, we're a Title VI Language Resource Center, um, and we're the sponsors of this event. If you want to know more about what the Language Resource Centers do, um, please do visit nflrc.org, website circle.arizona.edu. We'll make sure those links end up in the chat so you've got them there easily to click on um, and look there for future events that we have like this webinar today. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome Rebecca Aubrey um, here with us. Uh, she's a teacher of Spanish at the moment um, at Timothy Edwards Middle School in South Windsor, Connecticut. Um, but she's actually had over 20 years of teaching experience at pretty much every level imaginable, including 10 years of experience te teaching Spanish in grades K through eight. Um, she's presented on a lot of topics, um, ranging from um, the topic that we have today on differentiation, also positive behavior intervention strategies, um, how to encourage target language use, cultural and linguistic diversity in the classroom, um, and I think is uh, exactly the right person for us to have on this topic, uh, which I know actually came as a request of many of the people who follow us and attend our webinars. Um, she was, I also want to note, um, the NECTL, the Northeast Conference on the Teaching of Foreign Languages Teacher of the Year in 2018, and the Actful Teacher of the Year in 2019. And she'll be talking with us today about empowering learners in the language classroom. We all can do it, and she's going to tell us how. Um, all right, at this point, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Rebecca. Thank you to Circle for inviting me here today. And I just want to give a very special thank you to everyone who is here. Um, I'm, you know I, know, I know we're all exhausted. It's been a very crazy spring, I think emotionally and physically, as we've all adapted to distance learning and I think we're just kind of like trudging to the finish line at, on the East Coast. We're just finishing up school right now and I, I just really admire all of you who have uh, come here today to this webinar to continue to learn and, and work on your practices even regardless of how exhausted you might be at this point. Uh, so our goals for today, I was really um, thankful that Circle sent me some of your registration information where you talked about the topics that you were interested in. And so I've kind of tried to make some modifications to what I originally intended to do in response to some of the things that you were hoping to get. I regret that I can't necessarily touch on everything, but I will do the absolute best I can. So first, we're um, going to spend some time talking about how we can ensure differentiation for all students by empowering students and motivating through them through choice. Secondly, um, an, a topic that came up in a lot of your registrations was how we can differentiate for various proficiency levels, I think even including heritage speakers, and that is definitely something I will be talking about. There was a lot of interest in behavioral intervention strategies, including a trauma-informed classroom. And these are topics that I feel very strongly and very passionately about. It's not the central focus of the presentation, but I put it in italics because I'm hoping to kind of make some connections to it throughout the presentation. I always like to start with my why why I teach, uh, why I feel passionate about what I do, and why I feel so passionate about meeting the needs of all learners. This is a photograph of my daughter, Shannon. She's given me permission to share it. She likes when I tell her story. Uh, I adopted Shannon when she was 10 years old out of the foster care system. When um, Shannon was seven years old, her father passed away very suddenly. She was at home with him getting ready for school in the morning, and he suddenly started to feel ill. He asked her older sister, Amanda, who was at the time 10, to pick up the phone and call 911. And then he forced Amanda to get on the bus and go to school. Shannon rode the ambulance with him to the hospital where he ended up passing away from a heart attack. Amanda went to school not knowing what was happening and then later was pulled out of her class and told that he had passed away. And Shannon um, not only has that trauma history, but she also has um, multiple learning disabilities. And in our school system, she wasn't allowed to continue studying the language beyond the elementary grades. And it's something that I've advocated for very strongly on her behalf, but I have so many other battles to fight that it's one that um, I've had to let go. And it tears me up inside that as an advocate for languages, I haven't been able to be successful in that for my daughter. And so as a language educator, I am really committed to ensuring that I do continue to advocate for that for my students, but also ensure that I am meeting the needs of those students once they're in my classroom. And so this is really my why about 
the, the passion I feel for this topic and where I'm coming from when I share with you today. So typically when we talk about differentiation, we talk about accommodations and modifications. So accommodations to review quickly are any sort of changes in how we expect a student to learn material. And so that might, to learn and assess. So that might mean they take tests in a separate setting. It might mean that they provide, you as a teacher are asked to provide them with study guides. It might mean flexible seating that they get to move around the room versus a modification, which changes what a student is expected to know in the curriculum. So this typically changes the curriculum. It might mean you're reducing the number of test questions on a quiz. You might be exempting from certain assignments. You might be providing students with alternative assignments. When we talk about accommodations and modifications, these are typically things that we would find in a student's IEP and 504. And I know that was a topic that a lot of people had questions about was how can I meet the needs of students with an IEP or a 504. My concern with traditional differentiation strategies, just looking at accommodations and modifications, is that I feel that we are putting a lot of energy into planning our curriculum and then we have to run around and put out fires and put band-aids on different situations of students who have a 504 or an IEP or our heritage learners or our students with anxiety or our students who have um, suffered traumas outside of the classroom. So I feel like we're creating more work for ourselves than we need to. So the traditional accommodations and modifications don't necessarily meet the needs of a mixed proficiency level classroom or really address the question of how we're motivating students, which I know is a concern that a lot of people had, or trauma, or how does that impact how we're intervening with behaviors. And so I really like to approach differentiation in a different way other than talking about those putting out the fire strategies that happen after we have planned a unit. I really feel that we need to be differentiating for all of our learners, not just the ones with 504s and IEPs, not just our heritage learners. We need to find ways to differentiate for each and every student in our classroom. So how do we do that without causing a headache for ourselves? So when the way I would define differentiation is ensuring that we're matching each student's individual characteristics to the curriculum, each and every student in the classroom, that we're aware of the differences in learning styles, interests, skills, abilities that our students might have, and that we're modifying for all of our students the content that we're teaching them, the process, the product, and that ultimately we're effectively engaging all of the students in our classroom. Now, I know what you guys are all probably thinking right now, this lady's crazy, how can I create a separate curriculum for each and every student in our classroom? It's not what I'm advocating for. What I'm advocating for is from the very beginning of our planning process, how we can consider and really embrace the fact that all of our students are different. And so these are kind of the key principles that guide my planning that I will be coming back to throughout this presentation. Number one, we wanna make sure that we're meeting content standards. So our world language readiness standards or whichever standards you use in your state. I also believe, particularly in the younger grades, we very often make connections across to other content areas, and we want to ensure that we're helping to build 21st century skills. We, of course, need to respect the 504s and IEPs in our classroom, um, but we want to make sure that we're celebrating the, the diversity and the contributions that our heritage learners bring to the classroom, that we're embracing the skills in the interests of all of our students, understand and recognize that students learn at different rates. And if we come back to my, my daughter, Shannon's sister, Amanda, who walked into the school that day after having called 911 and then just had to pretend it was a normal school day, we really don't know what our students have lived through before they come into our classroom. We don't know what happened to them that morning. We don't know what they might be afraid to go home to. They might be in a perfectly healthy and loving home, but we something could have happened to them five or 10 or eight years ago, and we just don't know. And so we need to make sure that we're acknowledging that. We don't fully know what's happened to our students before they come into our classroom. So 
Um, before I continue, I'll just pause for a minute and check to make sure there are any questions about any of those key terms of differentiation, accommodations, and modifications. Anything, Chantel? Not so far, but please do go ahead and post Not, them in the Q&A as they come up and we'll make sure we get to them, okay? Awesome. So the, you know, the webinar is always an awkward format. I love to be able to engage and, and, and talk and answer questions. And so please, at any time, if you have questions, I will be stopping every couple of minutes to, to ask as I have different um, pause spots. Oh, Rebecca, we do have one. Could you just uh, define yeah. IEP? Because not everyone's familiar with it. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm so sorry. So an IEP is an individualized education plan. In the United States, we have federal law that mandates that students who have qualified under a variety of different disabilities have an individualized education plan that acknowledges what their disability is and what specific accommodations and modifications uh, they might need in order to have an equitable learning environment. And 540s while you're at it. I'm sorry? Uh, 504s. 504s. 504s, sorry. And yes. so, <laughs> uh, 504 is another um, kind of a subset of the manner in which we differentiate in the United States. And so this would be for students who have um, perhaps ADHD or diabetes and might just need certain accommodations in the classroom, but they haven't necessarily qualified for special education because they don't have a diagnosed learning disability. Thank you. All right. So, um, where the center of my planning is talking about how we can differentiate through choice. And I just want to give you kind of a little bit of a background on the research around student choice and why I find it to be so powerful. So when we're in the classroom and we prevent students with tasks that are either too hard or too easy, those tasks are unmotivating to students. Students aren't going to want to do something if it's too easy for them. And they're not going to want to do it if it's too hard for them. When we're able to offer students choice, it empowers them themselves to self-differentiate. And so instead of us needing to identify a variety of differentiation strategies, they're empowered to do it. By offering choice, we can tap into students' skills and interests, and that is motivating to students. Students learn when they're motivated. And how then does, does, does choice motivate? So uh, you may be familiar with the zone of proximal development, or I like to call it the Goldilocks zone, which I, I, I'm not the first person to coin that term. But um, this is this idea that each student is at a certain spot of, of learning or their understanding around a topic or their skills. And the Goldilocks zone is that zone that's not too hard for them, but it's also not too easy. But each student in our class is going to have a different Goldilocks zone. But when we can offer students choices within that zone, it's providing them with the appropriate level of challenge. And a key driver of motivation in the classroom is mastery. When people feel that they have mastered a task, they become motivated to continue learning. And that then positively reinforces learning. I know a question that a lot of you mentioned on your registration was that you were interested in how to motivate students more, and I'm hoping what I continue to talk about today will help answer that question for you. I believe, and the research shows this, that students will appropriately self-differentiate when they're empowered to do so. When you set up the climate and the culture for them to be able to do that, and when you set up the structures for them to be able to do that. And um, here is a source, it's an ASCD publication. You can Google it. I know that um, my slides will be on the CIRCLE website when I'm done. So if you miss this source now, you can get it. But this is where some of this research comes from. So then what are the impacts of offering choice? This really gets at a lot of the issues that several of you mentioned in your registration, how to motivate students more, um, how to respond to off-task behavior. Well. When we offer students choice, it reduces, number one, the workload on us because we're not reactively reacting to situations that arise in the classroom. Uh, students are challenged to do their individual best. Uh, research shows that deeper and richer learning will occur. Several of you mentioned an interest in social emotional learning. Social emotional learning increases because you're putting students in the driver's seat of their learning. They learn what works for them and what doesn't. They learn to plan better. 
um, it's also really fun because you learn more about your students. You learn the kinds of interests and skills that they had. And, and honestly, it, it makes teaching more fun. When you move from having students producing all the same project to having this whole limitless diversity of projects from your student, it makes it so much more fun for you to observe and provide feedback on and grade. So I want to show you a couple of quick examples of what that might look like. Um, I have some examples from some of my students who um, I'm going to show you three different examples. And of these students, I have one student who is a gifted and talented student. I have one student who is a heritage speaker. I have one student who has a history of explosive behaviors. I have a student who has some pretty serious learning disabilities and a verbal processing disorder. And I have a student who has a history of PTSD. I'm not going to play the volume on the videos because it's not relevant, but the, the project that the students did, this was in the first month of the school year, first year to Spanish. They were learning about where Spanish is spoken and how to describe the weather. So they were tasked with doing a weather forecast for a Spanish speaking country. They got to choose which country they wanted to do. They could choose the dates they wanted to visit the country. And they got to choose how they presented that information. All I told them was that they had to describe the weather for three days and it had to be a Spanish-speaking country, and I had to hear them talking about it. And so this first student decided to use green screen technology and travel to Mexico. And again, what she says doesn't matter. It's how she embraced choice in her presentation. And you can just see how excited she is. She uh, used a green screen, which was uh, a $1 tablecloth from the Dollar Tree store, hung it up behind her. Um, and this is the part that I really loved. She pretended to walk from one town in Mexico to another. This is another example of a student who did not want to show her face, but she created a whole series of little uh, like popsicle stick puppets. And she, sorry, she traveled to Machu Picchu and did three wet days of weather in Machu Picchu with these little uh, stick puppets. Um, and she is talking over it, but you'll see that um, she, in the background, there's a couple of days where it rained and she brought in sound of the rain and there you have her little rain cloud. She has other days when it's sunny and so she pops in a sun cloud. And this is another example of another student who did not want to show her face. Uh, but she's very artistically creative. She traveled to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and she created three different shoe boxes, one for each day of the week, and showed what the weather would be like each of those different days of the week, and included different scenery from Buenos Aires. So this just kind of shows you how when you unleash the creativity and choice in students, they can really take it in diverse directions. And it avoids a lot of the power struggles, the lack of engagement that you might usually see. And before I continue, are there any questions? We do have a couple of questions, actually. So one is just a clarification. Um, were the students speaking Spanish during the presentations? They were speaking Spanish, yes. OK. Um, and then we have a couple of questions that are all about how you understand the zone of proximal development or this Goldilocks zone. Um, so the first one is just how do, you, how do you choose what the appropriate Goldilocks zone is, or how do you approach that? Yes. Um, I'm, I think I will get to that as we move forward. And so if I don't, please feel free to um, ask the question again. But it really is different for each and every student. And you discover it by getting to know the students, but you also empower them to know it for themselves. Perfect. That sounds like an ambiguous answer, but. <laughs> no, that's great. And I'll actually just keep that live on there so that we can make sure that we come sure. back. Um, and then a um, couple other questions about how you view this relating to other kinds of concepts. And so if you want to come back to these at the end, I can hang on to them too. But one is how do you see this um, relating to project-based learning as a way to accomplish differentiated teaching? I think you were kind of already hinting at that with your examples a little bit. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, definitely. I'll, I'm, a lot of, I'm a big advocate of project-based learning. So several of the examples I show will be of project-based learning. And then the other question was how it relates to theories of multiple intelligences. Um, so for example, from Gardner. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it inherently embraces multiple intelligences because the way I try to design my curriculum, it, it empowers students to tap into those multiple intelligences that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then just one more that's popped up, um, and this might be, uh, oh, actually, sorry, two more about how you set up the assignments. And so if this is something you're coming back to, we can also leave it live. Um, about I will definitely get to it. Yes. <laughs> how do you present models um, for the mm -hmm. kinds of projects that you have students doing? Um, and then relatedly, what does the prompt look like and what are the criteria? Yes. Okay. I will definitely get to those things. Um, I also just wanted to, um, you know, kind of circle back a little bit to the to the benefits of offering choice because there were um, people who had expressed in your registration an interest in behavior intervention strategies. And I have found in my experience teaching in a multitude of districts across a multitude of grade levels that when you are offering students choice, you will see behavior uh, decline. Um, I've worked in urban districts, I've worked in suburban districts, I've worked in rural districts, all different um, ethnicities and um, demographics, and you, I, across the board, always see behavior problems decline. And that's largely because we know there's four different motivators of misbehavior. One of them is a feeling of inadequacy, so when a student feels like they can't um, do the task you're asking them to do, but if you're offering them choice, you're actually empowering them to identify tasks that are appropriate for them. Another um, key reason behind misbehavior is a power struggle. And so when you're offering students choices about what to do and how to learn, you're reducing the propensity to have power struggles with them because you're putting some of the choice into their hands. Okay, so um, the way I approach um, building this differentiation model is through backwards planning. And I'll um, kind of quickly review the steps of backwards planning. I don't know how familiar people are with them, but step one is beginning with your learning objectives. And so it's identifying your essential question. And then what are the specific skills and knowledge that students need to acquire as part of the unit or what you're hoping that they will accomplish? Second step, once you've established that, is to identify how you're gonna know whether or not they've met those learning goals. What's the evidence of that? And so that's your assessments, your projects, your observation. And thirdly, once you know how you're gonna know that students have learned what you want them to, you then begin to plan those learning activities well, that will help them work towards it. And so I'm hoping if time allows for us to go through kind of each of these steps and how I plan and how you can bring in choice so that you're ensuring differentiation for all students. Um, so with step one, we start with essential questions. Uh, I'm in a new district this year. And when I joined the district, these were some of the essential questions that they had for their curriculum. So how is your school day uh, or schedule different from that in a Spanish speaking country? What's your favorite subject in school or why? Uh, favorite foods? Um, if we were in a live session, I would ask you all what you think, whether you think these are good essential questions or not. But um, because it's this is the greatest forum for that kind of conversation, maybe I should have had a poll here. Um, I'll just jump to the punchline. In my opinion, these are not good essential questions. A good essential question should be something that's open-ended, that doesn't necessarily have a clear and specific answer. So, you know, we look at the second one, what are your favorite school subjects in school and why? I can quite simply answer, my favorite class in school is Spanish because it is so much fun. And we're done with the unit. It, it, it's, it's not an open-ended question. Um, they, they should also be transferable questions. They should be open to discussion and debate. And so I, I had mentioned that I have a meeting right after this webinar and it is actually with my professional learning um, team because we are revamping our curriculum. Um, here's a way that you could take these questions and turn them into questions that are more essential. So many of us have that school unit one way you could make it into a more of an essential question is just to ask how education might be shaped by where we live. And that then opens the door for so many questions. It also would facilitate units on social justice, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, but by making those questions more open-ended, 
um, is really how you can then begin to facilitate more choice because now students aren't being pigeonholed into talking about very um, closed topics. It, it opens the door for them to be able to explore things that they might be interested in, whether that's transportation to school, what the school day looks like, what are kids, how are kids subjects in schools different from ours and why, and would you want to go to school in another place? Why is it that kids in some places don't have the same access to school that we do? So it, it just opens up a whole new area of topics that can potentially motivate students. Um, you can also, when you, you know, look at that step one of backwards design, we have the skills and what's the content knowledge. We're always going to have some sort of vocabulary list in our unit, but I would encourage you to think about how you can give students some choice and voice in what that vocabulary list looks like. Yes, we might want to have a common vocabulary list, but, you know, if we're talking about clothing, and I, I look at the, my middle school boys who wear shorts. I, I'm, I'm in Connecticut. It snows in the winter. We get down to zero in the winter. And I have boys who will wear shorts all winter long. So why am I insisting constantly that they know how to say pants? Why not? I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's helpful. But why not empower them to learn to say the clothing that they want to say? And the same I would say with, with foods. Um, you know, exploring special diets. I live in a diverse, teach in a diverse community. Um, so making comparisons to different types of diets or even consider how you might instead say in this grade, we study Spain or in this unit, we only study Chile. Is there some flexibility to allow students to choose the country that they want to become a specialist in and they explore that country through the lens of the theme that you're working with. And so those are some ways that you can offer a student choice at that level. The second step is identifying evidence of whether or not students have learned what you want them to learn. And so this should come through various data sources from formal assessments to your observations. I don't believe we should give students just one test and determine, use that to determine whether or not they've learned the material. Um, if you are doing formal assessments, I'm actually required to in my district. I'm not a big fan of tests and quizzes, but um, some accommodations and modifications that you can make is by providing students with answer banks and also providing some flexibility in spelling. I was asked recently in a webinar if I grade for spelling and I do not. I follow a proficiency-based curriculum. Most of my students are intermediate high, but even when we get up into the, inter I'm sorry, most of my students are novice high, novice mid, but even when we get up into the intermediate levels, as long as a student is communicating and we can understand the intent of what they're communicating, the spelling shouldn't matter. If the spelling's so bad that we don't know what they're saying, then yes, they weren't able to communicate their point. Um, I would also encourage you to allow retakes for mastery of content. In my opinion, if I determine that something is important enough to want to quiz them or test them on it, it's because I want them to know it. And because not all students learn at the same rate if a student hasn't learned it the first time, I want to give them another chance to learn it. If we, we do have students who might have that accommodation in their 504 or IEP, but why can't we do that for all students? Just make that a part of our curriculum because all students learn at different rates. They all learn at a different pace and we should give them the opportunity to master what we're hoping that they should master. I'm also a big fan of student designed quizzes and I get a lot of questions about this. And so I put a little photograph of it. Um, for those of you who are not Spanish speakers, this is something I will do either in Google Classroom or in paper form. But you see this first column says dibujar, which means to draw. So I ask the students if we have a vocabulary list that we're working with that might have 15 terms on it. I let them choose 10 that they wanna be quizzed on and they will draw a little picture of those 10 items. I also incorporate extra credit. In the middle column, I tell them not to write or draw anything. And then in the far right, I ask them to write what the word is because sometimes in all honesty, I can't interpret their little drawings. So I, if they, you know, we're talking about fruits and vegetables and they draw an apple and they would draw a little apple here and then over here on the far right, they would write the vocabulary word for apple. 
I then copy these and on quiz day, I cut off the edge where the words are written. And so the students then just need to write their answers in. And then they go and they get their answer sheet and they self grade their quizzes. So in my opinion, this is valuable because they've still studied all of the vocabulary, but they're choosing which ones that they want to be tested on and they're actually designing their own quizzes and then um, grade their quizzes. For those students who need an answer bank, I have them write it at the bottom so that when they're taking the quiz, they have their vocabulary words there. And so this is just one way that um, I provide students with some choice on a formal assessment. And I, 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 I probably passed a pause for questions. Do you have any questions, Chantel? We have some additional questions that are about assessment. So if that's something you're continuing to come back to, then, then we might leave those two a little bit later. Okay, not formal assessments. Um, just a kind of bigger picture questions about how you navigate it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take them now. <laughs> All right, um, so one of the questions is still kind of about criteria or if it's more difficult to assess these kind of open-ended assignments um, uh, and then possibly related, so I'll go ahead and pitch it out there, um, is how do you feel about portfolio assessment and if that's something you've used? Yes, I love portfolios. Um, I actually use Seesaw as like a digital portfolio for my students. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that. Uh, it has a lot of popularity in elementary grades, but I've been training the teachers in my district in the middle school, and now I even have the AP high school teachers using it. But students can submit a variety, work in a variety of formats, and then it kind of develops a portfolio that we use to track their ongoing proficiency. Um, in terms of, I, I kind of lost the other questions there, Chantel, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I think it's kind of about what, okay. cri what criteria do you use for, for grading the more open-ended kinds of assignments? Okay, I'll get, I will get into that. Okay, okay perfect. So, There's a moving forward. Oh, yeah, go yes, ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just a real quick one that's actually about the way you set up the vocabulary quizzes, which I'm completely stealing, mm -hmm. that way of doing the yes. table, um, is do you allow <laughs> retakes and what does that look like? Yes. So again, I really believe in, in testing for mastery. And so I do allow retakes. What I do is I just keep a copy of the original quiz. And then if a student um, doesn't do well, which, you know, most of the time is because they haven't studied. And um, I know there's a philosophy there that if a student hasn't studied, they should accept the consequences of it. I personally feel that that's a social emotional learning growth and that if a student hasn't learned that skill, it's something that we need to teach them. So um, I do allow retakes of these quizzes. I only require, I don't let them do it in class time. So it, it's kind of an extra barrier for them. They either have to do it on one of the days that I stay after school, or they can come in and do it during their lunch time. And so that's just kind of, I think, an extra motivator for students. But I do let them retake it as many times as they want because I believe in testing for mastery and I take their top score. I don't average the scores because if they got 100% on the last quiz, and in my opinion, they now know 100% of the terms. And Chantal, I'm happy to share the Google Doc with you if you want. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, as I mentioned, I work in a proficiency-based, um, with a proficiency-based curriculum and a proficiency-based environment. And um, so another area where I like to give students choice is in their goal setting. And so someone asked me previously about that zone of proximal development and what it is. We work towards determining that through an ongoing conferencing process that I do with my students. Uh, in the beginning of the year, I introduced them to a pretty simple proficiency rubric. You see a copy of one here on the left. This is from World Language Classroom. Um, Musicuentos, which is another website, has a variety of student-friendly proficiency rubrics. But we spend a lot of time in class talking about what the different proficiency levels are. It's the only conversation that I have with students in English in the classroom. And I just kind of begin to notice things that students say. So if you look under um, novice high, it says speak in phrases. So if we're in class and um, I've asked a question, you might see have some students just answering in one word or answering in a list, but then another student speaking in a phrase, taking a memorized chunk of language. I would just verbally acknowledge that, you know, wow, Kate, 
that was a great phrase that you drew on and you pulled in and and then kind of we'll we'll take this little pause and what 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 not what proficiency level is that a quality of and so then the class is kind of cued in to some of the language about what the different proficiencies levels look like and we have that as part of an ongoing conversation so I kind of as their teacher through some of the work they submit begin to have feel a vibe of, of what level they're at and um, I do have about 120 students I have about 20 students in a class 20 to 25 students in a class and so you know, it's not necessarily an easy task, but I do begin to get a feeling for where some of the different students are. But by having this as part of an ongoing conversation, they become aware of it too. And we never talk about, you know, if you can speak in phrases, you're better than the next person, or you have the A and the next person has a B or a C. It's a constant conversation about how everybody is at a different place and that's okay. Everybody's being challenged from where they are to do a little bit better. And my students know that and they own that by the end of the first month of school. Early in the year, you know, I might ask a question and someone, or, you know, we're engaging in a conversation and someone else laughs at something a student says. That's another time where I will cut to English and immediately cut that off. And we talk about how not everybody's at the same place. We could understand what that person said, even though there were mistakes in it, and it's okay. We're all novice level language speakers. And so I really try to create a, a classroom climate where we all know everybody's at a different place and it's okay. And so by about December, November, December, my students are saying that before I do. And so if a student makes a mistake, before I can say anything, another student will say, we're novice learners, we all make mistakes, everybody's at a different place. And so they really come to own it. And that's what helps them themselves focus in on what their own Goldilocks zone is. And so one way, um, what, I, what I then do, one way I offer students choice is in what their goals are. And so on some of the rubrics that I'll share with you, you'll see that students determine their own proficiency goal on the rubric. And that'll be something in this language that they want to work on. So it might be um, they want to move from using lists of words to using memorized phrases. They might want to move from using full sentences to seeing if I can do some sentence creation. And we talk about that a lot. One of the assignments I did for the students this year, they all had a writing prompt. It was on the same topic that um, boring school unit, and what do you like about school and have to do at school? But the rubrics are all differentiated by proficiency levels. And what you see this photograph of is a box of those rubrics. And I put a box on each table and I asked the students, why do you think they're different colors? And the student said, because we're all in different places, they're different proficiency levels. And the students read them and they picked the rubric that they wanted to be assessed on. This was so powerful because out of my approximately 120 students, I had maybe two students who picked a rubric that was off where I would have put them and they chose too high. So students overwhelmingly will self-deferentiate. They will pick the appropriate level. They will pick their appropriate Goldilocks level. It's really remarkable to see. Something else that I'll do with students is ask them on this, this rubric was all created for them, but I will often have them individualize a project rubric so they identify a proficiency goal and they write it in their rubric. Um, I have to show you the cutest picture of a boy who didn't quite understand the directions. You know, I was expecting them to say something like, my goal is to speak in sentences. And he said, my goal is the ability to say, mom, I love you with all my heart in Spanish and to talk to others in Xbox in Spanish. I just thought this was the sweetest thing. I unfortunately had to <laughs> have him fix it, but I did share it with his mom first. So then in terms of the, you know, getting into the project-based learning, I like to offer students a lot of choice in how they show the learning. And I showed you a little bit of an example of that with the student projects on the weather. Um, you know, if you're new to giving student choice, you might feel more comfortable giving them a couple of set options. 
I spoke with um, actually cross-disciplinary teachers about this earlier in the year in my school. And one of the teachers came up to me really excitedly afterwards and said, I did what you did, what you suggested. I gave them, I gave them choice and, and they loved it. And it was so much fun. The stuff they did was so great. And I said, so did you just tell them they could do whatever they wanted to do? And she said, no, I gave them a list of 20 choices. Um, so so if, you, if you like to have the control, you can do that. Or what I always say to them is just do absolutely whatever you want. You just have to X, Y, and Z. And so I set really clear guidelines about what for me are the absolute must do's, what they have to incorporate in that project. So this might be specific knowledge, specific skills. They always ask me if they can work in partners or alone. Um, you know, is this writing? Is it reading? Is it an interpretive task? And then we always include some way that they're leveling up their, their language learning. So give the, the key to it is think, what is a non-negotiable to me? What, if I go back to my unit plan and what the skills and the objectives are for that unit plan, what are the non-negotiables? What do they absolutely have to show me? And then let go of everything else. Let them decide if they want to do a PowerPoint or a poster, if they want to study, you know, Uruguay or Spain. Let go of everything else. You know, focus on the things that are non-negotiable for the, you and then give them the choice with everything else. So um, I'll show you a couple of examples of what that might look like, and then I'll open it up to some more questions. So I know a very common project is to prepare for a trip to a target language country. Why not let the students choose where it is that they wanna go? Um, you could also have them study the weather and choose when the best time is to go. Have them choose the clothing and the items that they wanna pack. And then think about, what are the things that the project must include? Do you, are you going to require that they have a specific number of items of clothing? If so, what are they? Um, I always ask my students to, to show some sort of imagery in their projects because I wanna know when they say a word that they know what they're talking about. I don't promote translation, but instead that they show that when they're identifying clothing or they're talking about foods, they know what they're talking about. And then I always require some sort of oral com component to it. So some examples on um, this, this packing for a chip project. This is something I did a few years ago with fourth graders. And you see, I did get uh, the typical Google slideshow PowerPoint presentation. The student did a screencastify and embedded his voice in it. I had a student who did a poster and she presented it. I had students who did a little skit using fake phones. I had them all old phones I had in my room. They're old rotary phones. Um, and they had like a fake conversation with each other in which they talked about preparing for a trip in which they were each gonna pack. This student over here in the upper left brought in a suitcase with clothing in it and she labeled all the clothing and held one item up one at a time and talked about what she would pack. One of my favorites ever, I don't have a good image of it though, is of two students who present, pretended that one of them was going through the security line at the airport. And they set up a Google slideshow so that it looked like an x-ray machine. So as the suitcase kind of came through the x-ray machine, you'd see an outline of a shirt. And one of them who was pretending to be a, a security person said, what is this? And the other one said, it's two shirts. And they had this whole conversation back and forth in Spanish. Um, those were very um, extremely gifted and talented students. And so it, it it embraced their skills and their creativity versus a student who might have anxiety about doing something very fancy reverted back to something more simple like a Google slideshow. Um, last year with uh, eighth graders I worked with, I had to do the horrible, long, boring home unit. That was everything about the home and um, you know, cleaning the, the quehaceres, the cleaning the house, the rooms in the house, pieces of furniture in the house. And I, in the end, told them that they were going to do a project about the house, but it could be anything that they wanted to do. Absolutely anything related to the house. All they had to do was talk for at least a minute. They had to work on a habit of mind, a 21st century skill, and they had to self-identify a proficiency goal. Those were the only directions the students had. And so when they would come up to me and say, hmm, could I do 
like a poster that's a house for sale, describing the house for sale. And I'd say, you have to talk for a minute, you have to meet your proficiency goal, and you have to meet your habit of mind goal. And that, it just unleashed them. Um, there were people concerned about how you work with students with varying proficiency levels. I'll show you some examples of what I got. So this student um, was actually, had been homeschooled up until eighth grade. The rest of the students in the class had taken Spanish for several years. I kind of roughly transcribed what he said in Spanish. You can see that it's full of errors. It's very simple, but his proficiency goal was to try to make sentences. And he did that um, in a very simple way. It was very error prone, but, but his goal was to try to communicate in sentences. This student was at a much higher proficiency level. She did a poster for a house cleaning service in which she talked about room by room in the house what the house cleaning service would do. And so she used the future tense and used all of those cleaning verbs and talked about in the kitchen, we will. In the bathroom, we will. Um, so she did a really creative job. This student uh, was very intrigued by develop, about developing intercultural competencies, and she created dioramas of a bedroom in Guatemala in her own bedroom, and she did a very elaborate comparison of how they were similar and how they were different. And so you see in this one project embraced a variety of different proficiency levels. And I will stop there. Questions? Yeah, we do have a couple of questions about the, the voicing of the goals and how you um, appreciate that. So um, one, you talked a little bit about this, but maybe just to kind of clarify it further, um, how, do, how does that goal setting relate to the grades that they receive? Yeah, so if we go back to the rubric, an example of a rubric like this one, for example, the, I'm sorry, the yes I can column is the 100%. And so if a student has set a goal of being able to speak in sentences and they do that consistently, they would score 100% on that part of the rubric. So kind of a related question then. Um, one person was asking if you've ever experienced or if you have any concerns about honesty, you know, for example, a student setting a goal just because they know that that goal will be achievable and kind of trying to game the system. Right. So if you recall, I talked about the writing rubrics that I gave students in which um, I let them choose from among certain rubrics. I said I have about 115, 120 students. I recall two who chose the wrong rubric. So I know what their proficiency levels are. I know what's an appropriate level of challenge of them because I've gotten to know them. And so I was able to observe that there were only two students who chose some the wrong rubric and they chose one that was too hard for them um the other thing is that i i do spend a lot of time guiding them towards an appropriate goal so i i don't just say from day one okay you guys are going to pick your own goal go out and do it and i'll see you in a month with your project we have ongoing conversations i typically do stations in my classroom and one of the stations that we do periodically is conferencing with me and so the students will come over and we'll talk about their work. And I, I, by about February, we were able to have these very effective two minute conferences in which I would say, tell me about what, what's going very well for you. And we would look at their work and they would identify, it looks like I'm using all sentences. I say, yeah, that's pretty awesome. And then, you know, I would say, what do you think you need to work on next? And they would look at the proficiency rubric and they were able to identify something appropriate. So it all comes out of a conversation that we have and an ongoing conversation. Um, and this for me is where the Seesaw portfolio is so powerful because I'm able to write comments that kind of nudge them. I give them feedback that nudges them towards an understanding of where they are. So if I have a student who's consistently been speaking and performing in full sentences and comes to me and says, I think I can do lists, all I'd have to do is raise one eyebrow and they would, they would know that I know that that was wrong. So. Yeah, thank you. That's a really, I think a really helpful reminder about how that occurs as a dialogue as well. Um, yes. A couple of other questions that are more kind of related to um, proficiency levels. So um, one's more of a clarification, just again, what were the class levels of 
uh, of the kinds of examples that you're using. Um, and then for the goal setting specifically, do you do that in L1, L2, and how do you make those choices? Yes, so my students are all, um, it's their first year of Spanish, and so they're all coming in virtually with no background in Spanish. I have a very small number of heritage speakers. So day one, they're coming in below novice low. Our district target is to get them to novice mid by the end of the year for seventh grade. I find many of my students exceed that. Um, you asked me about proficiency levels and I lost the other question. Oh, just a clarification. Um, oh, sorry about whether you use L1 or L2 when you talk about when oh, you do the okay. Yes, and so I do at this level, again, because they're novice language learners, our conversations about proficiency level, our, our conferencing is always in English. Um, I, I am a big advocate of target language use, but that's the one thing that we do do in English. Great, thank you. All right, so um, we have about, I would say I probably have about five minutes left. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about choice in how students learn. Um, I had mentioned that I really like to do stations. I think I'll um, just kind of skip to this, this last slide where I talk about some of my favorite uh, classroom activities because there was interest in, in engaging students. But I think it also gets back to the question I, about, about differentiation because I really like to do stations. So I like students to be able to go through different activities in a class period. I feel that this helps to reduce a lot of behavior problems because I'm tapping into the multiple intelligences. We will have interpersonal speaking tasks, we'll have game-based tasks, we might have listening tasks, they might watch an Ed Puzzle video, they might be conferencing with me. Getting students up and moving around in chunks of time just has a miraculous effect on, on, on behavior. It really, um, brings a lot more, it reduces the behavioral problems that you'll have in the classroom, at least in my experience. Um, I think also by, by giving tasks in smaller chunks and allowing students to move around to multiple modes ensures that you're tapping into the different intelligences and tapping into the ways students might feel more or less successful by giving them opportunities to learn something through different modalities. Uh, here are some of my favorite games for engaging students. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with Kahoot and Quizlet Live. Gimkit has been a big hit lately. Um, if you don't haven't checked it out, check out Gimkit. It is a quiz-based game. Someone once described it as Quizlet Live on crack. Um, Gimkit is very high-paced. One of the features I like in it is called Kit Collab, in which kids can on the spot create their own questions and it's a great way to do circumlocution questions. So kids can propose a question if you're doing fruits and vegetables for example they could say a fruit that is red and round and then as the multiple choice options they'll list them and they, they do this all in the target language so my students will do this in the target language. So it's a great way for them to practice circumlocution. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the headbands game. This is a game my students love for working on uh, circumlocution. So we will have either vocabulary word cards or image cards and one student holds it up to the head and the other students in the group have to circumlocute to describe it and the student holding it guesses what the word is. It's a very engaging game and is great for working on building up their vocabulary and their circumlocution skills. I usually introduce it by playing it whole class first because they have to kind of practice how to do it. So the way I'll do that is I'll put one student up in the front of the room with the whiteboard to their back and the class will describe it and that person sitting in the seat needs to guess. Or you can put two students and they compete with each other. Um, another game I really like is Alternative Bingo and I got this idea from Laura Terrell. Uh, Alternative Bingo, you take, this is a no prep game. It's, it's great when you have 10 minutes left to class and you don't know what to do or your 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 lesson plan has just like fizzled and you want to do something different just have the kids brainstorm a list of the vocabulary words that you're working with and you write them all on the board let's say you're doing animals at the zoo you write them all on the board in the target language the students are sharing them out and then you ask them to take out a piece of paper and write down four of the words any four you then begin to circumlocute and describe the animal. So you might say it's big, it has black and white stripes in the target language, of course, 
the students then guess, oh, a zebra, and you say, yes, bingo. They cross it off. Once they get four crossed off in their list, they, um, they can call out bingo. So no prep whatsoever, but great for building circumlocution skills. Um, and once my students have learned how to do this, they can do it in a center by themselves. Um, and I can see I'm getting low on time, but um, I have some other ones that, you know, if anyone wants to email me, I would be happy to share about uh, the whisper challenge is not my idea, but there's information about it out there on the internet. Um, again, I, I always run out of time, but I, I'm, I'm happy to share any of these games with you if you want. But again, by offering a multitude of modes of input, by having students up and moving around, you're providing them with more choice and more differentiation, and you really will see a lot of the behavioral problems reduced. So I will just put up the last slide, my email, my Twitter handle is maestroaubreyct, and there's my Gmail address. I invite anyone to email me anytime if you have additional questions, and I'm sorry I ran out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Any so pressing questions, Chantal? We do have a couple of questions left, and I and I want to say there's 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 always so much to talk about on these topics. There's never enough. I know, I, and I get so excited. <laughs> so I appreciate your generosity in sharing the slides. So we'll be sharing those afterwards, and then being willing to ask um, questions. There's a there's a couple kind of remaining ones that I think I can cluster here. Um, so one is about you've talked a lot about um, this kind of. I'm going to call it attention between choice and control when you're doing these kinds of assignments. Um, and so one of the questions that came up is how do you navigate that in terms of the kinds of support that students might need? Um, the example was if they're researching a particular country that you yourself make sure that you're able to support the kinds of choices that they want to make. Um, and relatedly that you'll that you'll how do you help them to navigate avoiding cultural stereotypes while they're doing that? Yes, it, it's interesting because a very similar question um, came up. I, I, I mentioned I'm leaving here to run into some planning and my district supervisor said, um, you know, it's hard for us to cover every country because teachers haven't necessarily been to every country. And I said, no, but we can learn the skills for how we explore a country. And so I think even those cultural stereotypes, if we model how to question whether or not something is a stereotype, and then kind of empower them to ask those same questions. We don't need to be a country expert in everything and we don't need to, you know, kind of run around and nitpick at those stereotypes. They're, they're likely to happen, but if we know we can respond to them when we, when we see, but I think it's more about teaching them how to research and examine a culture. Yeah, thank you. I think it's really empowering for teachers as well to think about it that way. Yes. Um, we did have a couple of people um, who were asking if you, kind of in this new context that we're in, if you've come up with any good strategies for maintaining those kinds of engagement and movement that you talked about in a remote learning or an online learning context. Yeah. Um, you know, it's been very challenging, and I, I think different districts have responded in different ways. In my district, um, we were not required to meet with students and we, we couldn't require students to meet with us. And so I did have voluntary Google Meets with my students. And for me, a really essential piece was reconnecting with them. And so a lot of what we did was more game-based stuff. So we did play like a lot of Quizlet. And um, those are actually really fun for those of you, I don't know how aware people are with Quizlet Live, but you know, you put kids in teams. I told all the kids to unmute themselves and shout out the answers to the people in their team. And so it became really engaging and fun. It was totally chaotic to have, you know, 15 kids all shouting out a bunch of words in Spanish, but it, it got them very engaged. And then also, again, I used a lot of Seesaw and a lot of Pear Deck during distance learning. And so I was able to offer a kind of a lot of choice and flexibility with those formats. Great, thank you. Um, I do see we're at the hour, and so I want to be aware of time. We yeah. have a couple of a little questions that are remaining, but I'll, but I think we'll try to share those with Rebecca and see if we can get you um, answers after the webinar. Please do. Um, you will all have seen a poll pop up um, with some questions. Uh, those are really to help us in uh, developing future webinars as well. It also helps us in continuing to advocate for programs like this um, to, for example, the Department of Education. So please do that poll um, and we'll be sending you all a more open-ended questionnaire that'll um, give Rebecca probably some ideas, but also give us some ideas for future webinars. Um, I do at this point, I want to thank Rebecca one more time. I know you all are muted, so I'm going to clap for you and I'm going to assume you're joining <laughs> 
clapping for this great webinar and the information that we had. Um, I also want to thank um, Kate Mackay and Sochil Coronado Vargas, um, our circle team here who've been running this webinar. Um, and then please do um, continue to look for our events. Um, and uh, one of the things that we wanted to plug in particular is the global literacies communities. Um, so if that might be something you're interested in learning more about how to teach global literacy, um, particularly in K more K-8 contexts, um, then go ahead and follow that link. Um, and we have a call for applications that includes um, some mini grants for supplies. Um, so, and we will be sharing the uh, slides and we will have a recording of the webinar available for those of you who want to come back to it. Um, and thank you again, Rebecca, for all this really wonderful information. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being here.